digging deeper into the lives, the stories, and the passions of people on today's education landscape. This is In Conversation on Voice Ed Radio. I'm your host, Stephen Hurley. Well, if the Ontario government has its way, secondary school students in the province will soon be required to take at least two of their high school credits online. Now, we know two is a reduction by half of the courses originally being proposed in the spring reform package, but the mandatory nature of the requirement still has educators, their unions, as well as some parents and researchers scratching their heads. At the very least, people are scrambling for further details. It's a discussion that is extended beyond Ontario's borders and has people talking throughout the country. It's a conversation that we continue today on Voice Ed Radio. So today on In Conversation, we head west to speak with two people who have been deeply committed to exploring e-learning and the research and practice around it for many years. Randy Labonte is the CEO of the Canadian e-learning network, Can e-learn for short. It's a Canadian registered not-for-profit society dedicated to becoming a leading voice in Canada for online and blended learning. Also joining me today, Michael Barber, originally from Newfoundland, but now living in the warms of California, Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Services at Turo University in California. Michael and Randy have co-authored a newly released article with an intriguing title, Sense of Irony or Perfect Timing, examining the research supporting proposed e-learning changes in Ontario. Many of our Voice Ed Radio listeners are part of the Ontario scene, and so this is a conversation that will hopefully resonate. It may raise some shackles, it may answer some questions, it may lead to further conversations. Gentlemen, I appreciate you taking time to talk with me today. I feel we should begin this conversation with a, a kind of a group existential sigh, because this is a this is an area of conversation that is far from being simple. And it has political, it has pedagogical, and it even has practical dimensions and impact. But you've jumped into the fray with an article that you hope is going to help us wade through some of that complexity. But even before we jump into that article and start to unpack it a little, let's place your work in some sort of larger context. Randy, what exactly is Can e Learn and where does it sit in relation to the conversations that we have about online and blended learning across the country? Well, Can e Learn is, is just a collection of educators uh, who we came together at different events, starting in the US uh, and found strength in networking uh, with great ideas, but then as soon as that event ended, they kind of petered out by the time we went back into our regular work uh, north of the border. Uh, and then probably around the third or fourth time that happened, we realized that why do we keep coming south to an event? We should be creating some networking opportunities in our own backyard, which we did. Uh, and so <clears throat> educators uh, and leaders from across uh, the process, as well as in Ontario and Quebec and Nova Scotia, came together and, and sort of ma mashed out uh, an approach that would work. Uh, we decided to register as a national not-for-profit uh, to support a structure. Uh, and from there, we've continued to support networking opportunities and build partnerships with others in the provinces. Given that education is a provincial jurisdiction, we don't really have policy or advocacy or direction like, say, an organization like INACL did in the U.S., uh, or that uh, CEA or others, we looked at affiliations with other net groups in Canada, but realized that really the K-12 educators who are active in digital learning, whether that be online or blended or e-learning uh, in general, uh, really have a sort of a uniqueness to the work that they're doing. And so what we try to do with the, the organization is one, to provide information, ideas, resources available that in other jurisdictions to cross through the silos of provincial education where people can share together. Uh, more importantly, to highlight and be active in research uh, as well as professional learning opportunities. So we foster events, bring people together for networking, but also for learning opportunities uh, to the best of our ability and our budgets. We're not a large organization 
at all. Uh, we are based in active, we have a lot of active volunteers. Michael Barber is one of the volunteers and a founding member of the, the network as well. And so it just becomes a vehicle for us to pursue some activities. And in from Candy Learn as an organization, those are not political. They are more research and professional learning opportunities for K-12 educators. So, Michael Barber, you have a stake in these conversations, not only as a Canadian, but as an educator and now as a researcher in California. I started my interest in, in research when I was actually a teacher back in Newfoundland and um, we were engaged in a, a distance ed program, an online program in my school district for AP students. And I was working on my master's at the time. And that's sort of how I got into the field. And this would have been back in the, the late 90s when we first started this. So um, it's it's been a while now. I guess this is I'm entering my third decade into uh, the field. Um, the, the project that I've probably spent the most time on and the most sustained is the annual State of the Nation uh, K-12 e-learning in Canada study that um, should be due to come out sometime in the next few weeks uh, for the at least the 2019 version, the one that covers the 2018-2019 school year. But it essentially looks at the nature of regulation and the level of activity of K-12 distance online and blended learning across the country on a province by province, territory by territory basis, as well as I guess for the, the last decade, looking at those few programs that also fall under federal jurisdiction. So in addition to that annual report, and one of the reasons we're here is to talk about a newly released article that was co-authored by you and Randy, Sense of Irony or Perfect Timing examining the research supporting proposed e-learning changes in Ontario. So this is a very pointed and specific article about Ontario. Tell us how this article came about and, and why you've written it. We were actually framing this uh, article as a, a proposal to the 2020 American Educational Research Association Conference. And as we note in the, in the very first line of the, the abstract, it came about because literally weeks after the um, government in Ontario announced these e-learning uh, or these e-learning proposals or changes, the American Educational Research Association was having its its annual meeting in Toronto at the time. And one of the themes of this year's uh, conference was this idea of actually using research to engage with educational practitioners and policymakers to help guide better decisions. And, um, you know, Randy and I had been doing a, a fair amount of work throughout the um, the spring following the announcement of posting blog entries uh, on the Candy Learn website that uh, looked at various aspects of the different announcements. And um, we saw this as an opportunity to sort of consolidate all of, you know, those 100 word, 300 word entries into a more developed research based piece, which uh, is sort of where this came about. So I'd love to get your sense of what the intention of the government was here. As soon as this announcement was made back in the spring, you know, conversations started across each of those dimensions that I mentioned at the outset, the political, the pedagogical, and even the pragmatic. I'm curious to know how each of you gauged the announcement. Uh, was this a way of cutting money from the education budget, or was there an attempt to work towards possibly better educating our students for life in the 21st century? <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's it's a, it's a difficult to speculate about what the intentions are when there are no specifics. So there's an announcement of four. So when we heard that, we just simply did what uh, we researchers kind of would do, and what an organization such as Canny Learn, which is not doesn't take a political stand, and certainly in what's going on in any province. Uh, in terms of activities, <clears throat> but we ran the numbers and, and published it. It's a tenfold increase is what was originally proposed based on the research that we had at hand about what current at level of activity was. Uh, and it was across all students, not necessarily just those that were looking for academic uh, approaches. The, the difficulty is as the details have still yet to be released and funding that would be supportive of this uh, and the budget, which would indicate whether it was a cost-cutting uh, initiative, uh, is simply speculation. There's nothing in writing yet. So, Michael, I'll let you chime in probably a little bit on this as well. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's that been the, the real difficulty, has been the, the lack of details. I mean, your initial sort of two frames that you put it, it, it's entirely possible that it could be either of those. When we've seen these kinds of of mandates being put into various U.S. states. And at, at one point, there was as many as 11 states that that had these kinds of mandates um, introduced, actually, well, not just introduced, that were passed at one point in time. Um, it was always uh, publicly under the guise of, you know, we're into the 21st century, the education system needs to, you know, modernize and and stay up to date with existing technologies and that students, when they leave the K-12 system, regardless if it's, you know, they're heading into a more career and technical uh, training route or if they're heading off to university or what have you, you know, this is how they're going to learn for the rest of their lives. So let's teach them how to, to learn in this format now. And on face value, that sounds like a legitimate rationale. Um, one of the things that we've clearly seen from the American example is that um, oftentimes this is often seen as a cost-cutting measure, although in jurisdictions where that has been the case, what we've also seen is it, it has a significant impact on the quality of education that's put forth, but that shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, you know, if you spend $100 on an item, you're going to get an item that's 10 times the quality in most cases of an item that you spend $10 on. Um, and education is no different. Um, you know, so a lot of that is, 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 as Randy said, speculation at this point, because really we don't know much about what they're planning. You know, the original announcement said four and that they were going to centralize the system and that it was going to come into place, you know, in one year, but the infrastructure for the technology wasn't going to be in place till the end of the following school year. In question period one day, the minister alluded to the fact that um, students that had IEPs might be exempted. And then when the revised announcement came out in November, there was reference to that again. They also decreased the number down to two. They moved the timeline for the technology infrastructure up by a year, possibly a year and a half, depending on when they act, you know, when that year they actually finish it. So it, it's really a moving target. And, and, Unfortunately, to speak to the motivations of why they're doing it is is just speculation at best, and I would say disingenuous at worst. Okay, so fair enough. Let's let's leave that aside for now. But although to your point, the lack of details, and this is a sticking point with some of the major unions here in Ontario, if it is a moving target, then it makes it very difficult to to bring it into negotiations and say, you know, we're willing to walk for this uh, when we really don't know what this is. Fully agreed. Yes. I mean, it's not like the government has said, you know, this is what it will look like, or it will follow the current model that e-learning is being implemented in the province, which, you know, isn't a bad model. And I think, in all honesty, that labor unions would be able to get behind because the the model actually requires that you have both an online teacher and a certified teacher that's local to the student that still has that in local parentis role so even if you did some small adjustments with class size they're being supervised by two teachers instead of just one so the class size numbers are skewed in favor of the you know the the the, the teachers uh, compared to the, you know, so those kinds of details I think would really help the situation and and would allow us to have I think a more informed conversation around this because now it's you know you've got one side that's saying they're doing this because they want to save money and they're taking money out of education and that it's going to provide a low lower quality of education which it very well might because we don't know that's going to be the case. So in your article, Michael, you point out and you actually do a very good job of outlining the current infrastructure structure and the structure that supports e-learning and blended learning in the province of Ontario. And it's, it's quite robust and, and it's not something that was created overnight, but it's something that's developed over the years. Let's put the political aside for a second and let's talk about the practical. Does Ontario currently have what it takes? Do we currently have the infrastructure to support that? Um, I don't 
believe with the current infrastructure, no. But one of the things that, and this is a point we make in the article, is that oftentimes these kinds of announcements and mandates from government are the things that drive infrastructure. You know, we've seen lots of cases where, you know, there we've decided that we, federal and provincial programs, um, that, you know, we buy this date, we will put this sort of infrastructure in that will allow us to do X because it's X that is really the goal here, but we need to, you know, put the infrastructure in place in order to do that. And one of the things that you can say about the government in at least the two announcements that they've made is if you look at the timeline around the technological infrastructure from the March announcement to the November announcement, it's changed and it's become much more aggressive. And I think part of that could be, and I say could because we, again, don't know much of what's happening here, um, could be a way of using this mandate to ensure that all schools do have the technological infrastructure to do that. Because in all honesty, you know, it's only a few days from now, we're in, in into the, the third decade of this new millennium. I mean, all schools should have this now. It's sort of, you know, a bit disappointing that we do have jurisdictions that don't have it. But, um, I mean, we could be talking about any number of issues, uh, both inside and outside of education right now, saying it's disappointing that we don't have X or Y at this stage. The most important part of this is the model. And what we've seen in Ontario is that there is a very strong model that has evolved, both with a central learning platform, uh, Bright Spaces Virtual Learning Environment, as they call it, uh, is is provincially licensed and available to any teacher in the province. Uh, they on that platform, the the Ministry of Education develops courses. There are a number of things for uh, that are involved in supporting teachers and resources in order to work uh, and work, engage students in that platform. There are schools that obviously have. Uh, virtual access, uh, internet access, there are challenges, there are differences, uh, and then that brings in the rural uh, issues that are there. But there's also some advocacy for that through an organization like Contact North uh, and different strategies that are used. So there are issues and limitations, but what, and that's consistent across all of the provinces. But what Ontario has is a model uh, that is effective and in our research around in different areas is a model that many uh, provinces are migrating to, whether it be driven through uh, the ministry provincial government or be driven through the practitioners themselves. So in British Columbia, for example, there were a number of programs that were um, just virtual at a distance. They have collapsed back into a much more uh, community-oriented program with effective opportunities for students to engage in some face-to-face -face activities as well as online activities. So there's much more of a shift away from just directly the, what the correspondence model of uh, students are the only drivers in their education to a more community-based, supportive model for students to engage in learning in online environments. So, and I have not seen any backtracking um, at all from that model uh, as, as of yet, or any replacement to that model that the ministry is, is or the government has come forward with. So I think that, that uh, the, the issues, uh, sorry to shift back into a bit of political, but the issues are around some of the terms so if the question is, right now, approximately, um, at least, Michael, you've got it as 5% of students, but based on the number of courses, there's basically about uh, a tenth of the students that are active in terms of online courses as opposed to um, classroom-based courses. So, so we're talking about doubling uh, the number of courses or uh, accesses to a different modality. Is that healthy? Uh, it certainly is worthwhile because students that are graduating from uh, secondary schools will be taking at least one of their courses, if not two or three courses in an online medium in the post-secondary institutions. So do they need to have the skills to do that? Absolutely. Um, when the, the, the flash points are the terms mandatory, uh, which which then starts begging the question, which I, the, the teachers' unions, as well as some of the other research, 
is the exclusionary uh, aspects for students that don't have technical access or do not have the skill set or ability to, to, and or more importantly, the supports in place to work in those programs. So that becomes a, a relatively important part of that, that, that uh, whole view. So the word mandatory is definitely contentious in this whole conversation, as is the word all, because we're, we're talking about success for all so much more now than we were, I believe, 20, 30 years ago. And that's, I guess, one of the objections that I've heard most often is that e-learning is not appropriate for all students. Michael, how do you respond to that objection? That issue is like saying that, you know, textbooks aren't appropriate for all students or pens aren't appropriate for all students or all students can't learn in the classroom. I mean, there, there's two things that are happening here. First is it implies that the classroom is this wonderful learning space that all, you know, this utopian environment that all students are having success in right now when the reality is, is that many of the challenges that are being raised by the opponents of this proposal about the things that online learning can't do, the reality is the classroom hasn't done a good job at doing most of these things either to this point. The other thing that, you know, folks often ignore is the fact that what we see in Ontario, or for that matter, any jurisdiction right now when it comes to online learning, is a model that was developed based upon a specific population of students that it was trying to serve. In the case of Ontario, till now, it's been primarily supplemental students. And in many cases, the more academically inclined students that would engage in these sort of supplemental environments. And you need look no further than to many of the credit recovery or summer school options that have been replaced by online learning and the lack of success that we've seen because they've tried to take that model that was developed for those more academically inclined supplemental students and apply it to those students that were in summer school or those students that were looking for credit recovery. But the same thing would be true in a classroom. If I was teaching in an IB or an AP class and tried to use those pedagogical strategies when I was teaching a basic level or credit recovery course, I'd have limited success as well. The, the fact of the matter is, is that the online environment is just that. It's an environment in which we employ different strategies, uh, both pedagogical and instructional design strategies in terms of how the content is delivered and how the, the, the materials are designed for the students. And you can't walk into that with a one-size-fits-all approach, but you can't do that in the classroom either. Um, and and that's, that just hasn't been part of the conversation. When I've looked at things I've seen in, in the media, both the popular media and social media, it's this assumption that the online environment is one thing. And that one thing caters to one group of students and the rest of the, you know, the, the student population is going to suffer because of that. And if that is how it's implemented, and again, we don't know much about how this is going to come down, but if, if that's how it's implemented, I fully agree with those people. But if that's what classroom teachers in downtown Toronto are doing, then they're going to get up, end up with the same results. So I'm thinking of the work that Jesse Stommel, Sean Michael Morris, and others have been doing at the post-secondary level, really taking a critical approach and a critical look at the way we think about online e-learning, blended learning, and that whole set of environments, because you're right, it's not just one. So I'm wondering how might a more critical approach to this, combined with some of the research that you and others have been doing, how can that help us to change this conversation a little? What are some of the fault lines perhaps that we might be able to fill in or at least recognize uh, with different sorts of questions and, and different sorts of conversations? Well, I, I think there are two issues in that question. Um, if it's the conversation that we're currently having in the current environment or the existing environment where you have a couple of labor unions that are involved in collective bargaining, um, you've got a mandate that's ill-defined and is tied in with those negotiations. I'm not sure that 
you can have a lot of those nuanced conversations because again, it's part of that, that as you alluded to yourself earlier, Steve, part of that, that, you know, early, that collective negotiation that's happening. Um, I think if the details of what the government was planning were very specific and very defined in nature, then it would allow us to be able to go in and look at those aspects and actually start having meaningful conversations around how this is going to work. And I think that's the the big difference. We're still caught up in the conversation right now as whether or not we should be doing this as opposed to, okay, we are doing this, now let's figure out how to do it well, you know, and how to do it right, and how we don't end up disadvantaging one group of students over another, and those kinds of conversations. But as long as there's still some uncertainty in the topic, and and still this belief among some that it's a moving target, or that they have the ability to potentially change or reverse the mandate, I think we're going to continue to have the same kinds of conversations that we're having now because, you know, shades of gray don't make for good um, negotiating tactics, regardless if you're a labor union or you're trying to sway public opinion as a commentator in, you know, on a newscast. Um, you know, black and white positions tend to work much better in those kinds of things. And, and until something becomes definitive, I think that's where we're going to be stuck. Well, it's, it's interesting, just as an observer. I mean, um, uh, I'll point out that today the National Post uh, launched an article listing all of the initiatives that were uh, either uh, cuts announced or new program announcements by the Ontario government that had been walked back. So I think that we're in this state, as Michael said, of the political issues and ramifications. I have no doubt that if cutting costs and increasing the number of students that teachers are responsible for will have potentially very negative consequences for some students and the marginalized students are a particularly uh, the groups that are that are affected most uh, you know immediately I, I've watched um, in programs evolve across Canada that uh, actually are creating efficiencies in terms of how learning is organized and the drive is not to save money. The drive is to use the existing resources to the best of ability to engage effective learning with students. So in the hands of good educators, good teachers, uh, they can use whatever materials that they have to do their best. Can they do better? Yes. If a, an introduction of e-learning is to increase, it's going to c- cause and need more resources up front to ensure effective training, effective instructional design, effective access, technically, et cetera, because that is typically what's happened. It certainly has been the experience in post-secondary where there's a heavy investment that is done and then efficiencies are found afterwards. Uh, Right now, and again, to go back in Western provinces, they're looking for online learning opportunities to increase the the ability to access and, and get access for students to effective training and education opportunities. So there's a lot of rural communities that are looking at e-learning as a way in which to to engage students that would not be active in courses. A great example in Ontario is Cablefo, the Franco-Ontarian boards for a number of years, all 12 of them have shared resources, shared approaches in an effort to ensure that French students can get all of their secondary courses in a French language, as opposed to having to go and, and, and enter into an English classroom. So they have been done to uh, support that, and e-learning has been an effective part of that. So right now, the current situation is an effective model, great collaboration of consortiums that are effectively working in Ontario, very similar to what's happening in other provinces, but we have the politics. The political question is in front of all of us, uh, which is not getting to that whole implementation question which has been described. Does the government have the appetite to put the resources? Will they commit to that? No one knows what the government will do. Um, And so you work with what you have. So the consortias have been very effective in Ontario to continue to do what they're doing, to continue to showcase what successes they've had. And we as an organization are putting that out into the discourse as best as we can to ensure that accurate information is available to everyone. 
So it is a little bit frustrating, more than a little bit frustrating. I know from my perspective as a bystander, no longer involved in the system officially, to hear that we might have to wait until the political juggernaut has been solved to get to those more nuanced and subtle conversations, uh, well, that's, that's frustrating in and of itself. On the other hand, I think we need to keep inviting people into those conversations so that when it's time to have them, we're ready. And Michael, I know you've been doing a lot of research over the years, almost three decades, as you pointed out. It's a long time. And when you listen to these conversations that are going on now in the public space and in the legislatures right across the country, what are some of the what are some of the blind spots that your research has kind of brought to your attention then that maybe the rest of us would benefit from having brought to our attention? The one that I, I guess that that I continue to see, and it's the one that when I approach practitioners, particularly uh, those that are in leadership positions within the, the K-12 environment, uh, building level, uh, you know, principals, assistant principals, or folks that are on the, the school board um, or working at the, the school board office, uh, when you sit down and look at a particular population of students and say, how can we design a program that includes some aspect of technology-infused learning, so online or blended or, or, or hybrid or some whatever term you want to use for that personalized, competency-based, what have you, and you sit down and say, okay, I, what are the specific needs of these students, both in terms of who they are as learners, but also who they are as individuals? Um, because one of the things that we've seen in the U.S. in particular is that in many cases, it's not an intellectual or academic ability issue that is preventing a student from having success. You know, in many cases, uh, it's because, you know, that they're the eldest sibling of, you know, uh, two or three younger siblings with a single parent that's working. And because of that, the, the, the eldest sibling has to work themselves to help support the family. So, you know, trying to even make it to school during the school day when they might have hours that they could be picking up. Um, or if they were working late into the night so they aren't able to, you know, work on their studies. Um, even something as simple as the fact that we divide our school days up into these one-hour blocks and that at any given point in time, students are responsible for four or five courses um, at a given time, which means that their attention span and their ability to recall and try to personalize and internalize content is so divided. You know, one of the programs that I, I'm familiar with in the U.S. did something just as simple as only requiring students to take two courses at any given time. So that way they only had two subject areas that they had to focus upon. But as soon as they finished one course, they were automatically enrolled into another course. So throughout the course of, you know, that September to June time period, they would still do the same number of courses that any other student in the state would have done. But instead of doing them four or five at a time, they were doing them two at a time. And, you know, something simple like that, that just helped that particular population of students um, succeed, um, you know, was remarkable. And I think that's one of the things that, that I always find folks just don't talk about. You know, the we assume that students are this monolithic group and it's something that, you know, we have to do something for all of them or for none of them, as opposed to looking at them, not necessarily, you know, with the idea of uh, a lot of this individualized, personalized or customized instruction that you see coming out of the U S which oftentimes is, is technology based and in all honesty, very direct instruction focused, but looking at groups of students that have similar characteristics and how can we design programs that are going to be appropriate for their particular needs. And that's something that I think that when you start to look at these alternative style programs, it gives us an opportunity to talk about, regardless if, if a mandate like this actually gets implemented or not. That's one of the conversations that I think should be happening that really still hasn't happened yet. Interesting. And Randy, I know you go to a lot of conferences, you actually organize a lot of conferences, you have many conversations right across the country. And I'm wondering, have the questions or the way that those conversations, those gatherings have been framed, has that changed over the years? I'm thinking, 
you know, we're a few days away from the beginning of 2020 and that year promises, well, I'm going to say more visual acuity and clarity. So in the name of that acuity and increased clarity, what are some of the new questions that maybe should be bring us, bringing us into the new decade? So uh, one of the things that's lacking is there's a dearth of research in K-12 in Canada uh, in e-learning. Uh, there's, you know, through our network, we would love to support more research, get more student voice active in terms of what their needs are in order to be successful uh, in, in learning approaches uh, that are, are common. It's, it's a, a, but more importantly, it, the, the critical questions come back to pedagogy, to design, and then support. So with the shift to personal learning, how do I support that myself as a teacher to do that? I think that technology and digital learning spaces and materials provide a tremendous uh, support package for uh, teachers in that they are set up, designed, and available to be used as part of that shift towards more personalized. So a lot of the, the questions uh, come around the organization of learning in terms of and learning spaces, whether they be learning commons, whether they be digital environments, uh, they're becoming uh, much more of a mashup that uh, programs are starting to build collectively within a school division, school uh, district, or school board, as the case is in Ontario. Uh, so the questions come back around design and pedagogy, I think, are important questions. How do we leverage this digital technologies that are available to us to better meet the needs of all of the students, those that um, are capable of working more remotely and independently, but also those that are not capable. How do we use the, these same technologies to create more and better collaboration and communication with them? Well, I don't think I'm the only one who feels we're just getting started on these conversations. And I wanted to thank both of you for being here. And again, reference the article that you've written. It can be found in the International Journal of E-Learning and Distance Education. It's called Sense of Irony or Perfect Timing, Examining the Research Supporting Proposed E-Learning Changes in Ontario. And its authors, Randy Labonte and Michael Barber, have been my guests. Uh, Michael, just before we go, is this article available readily? or do we have to subscribe to the journal? Yes, it's an open access journal that's published by the Canadian Network for Innovation in Education. Um, so if folks were to Google it, they would be able to find both an HTML and a PDF and an EPUB version right off of their website. So my guest today, Randy Labonte, the CEO of the Canadian e-learning network, Can e-learn, and Michael Barber, Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Services at Turo University in California. I'm Stephen Hurley. This is In Conversation. For more great content, be sure to visit voiced.ca. There you'll find our latest blogs, live broadcasts, podcasts, and an ongoing invitation for you to become part of this growing and dynamic community of people who care about the conversations in education. Thanks very much for listening.